So hello everybody, this is Bunte Joe here, and I'm just here at the ruins of Endegala actually, which is a, um, a kind of apparently was the um, resting place of an ancient king in, uh, in Sri Lanka. And uh, there's this, um, uh, uh, there was a request from uh, Leslie from the Buddhist Mahavihara in Malaysia to record a talk. And so I thought to record a short talk uh, for that group, uh, maybe about 20 to 25 minutes and uh, didn't have any particular topic uh, in mind, so I'll just kind of uh, wing it, <laughs> or I guess, and, uh, and see what uh, comes up. So, um, so for a kind of, uh, for a Buddhist practitioner, there's many different kind of uh, modes of practice that one can do. And kind of, uh, mo by modes, I mean there's many aspects to a person's practice. There's kind of uh, dana, there's uh, sila, there's bhavana, these are the three classics. And then there's also kind of ways that people practice in general. People sometimes practice a chanting. You know, sometimes people will study explicitly the stutas. Sometimes people will uh, study the abhidhamma. Sometimes people will study the commentaries or the atakata. And as far as bhavana goes, there's people who like to do samatha. There's people who like to do vipassana. There's people who um, like to do a mix of both. <laughs> There's people who like particular topics, some people like a suba as a topic, some people like the breath as a topic. And so there's all these different ways that one can approach one's Buddhist practice, that one can approach um, one's kind of entrance into the Dhamma and one's growing in the Dhamma. The thing about all these approaches is that in Buddhism, uh, basically all of them, like the scientific term for them is they're teleological. In other words, they're, they're aimed at an end. And it's kind of the Buddha's aim in doing his teachings wasn't to uh, describe reality out there. This is one of the differences between Western philosophy and Eastern philosophy, or Western philosophy is in uh, European philosophy and Indian philosophy. So apparently what I'd read, and uh, there may be people out there who are experts who, could, uh, who know a bit more, but that uh, philosophy in the West was, um, uh, was kind of uh, uh, centered around the I. In other words, are the things that we're looking at real or not? And kind of what's really out there, you know, what is it, uh, what is the reality of the world? And philosophy in India, at least, from what I heard, was concerned with actually the mouth, kind of uh, um, in terms of trying to find a source of food. What is it that will um, give us a, a permanent source of food? So all beings need to eat. And so for this reason, the Buddha describes, I mean, Partially for this reason, the Buddha's teachings are aimed at an end. Uh, they're, um, they're kind of uh, within, uh, or within, they're part of this kind of Indian group of thought. Uh, his teachings would fit into, uh, into this kind of general thrust in Indian society in that way, um, which is that uh, they're aimed at finding a permanent source of happiness. And so the aim of the Buddha's teachings isn't to, uh, isn't to become a really great scholar. It isn't to become a really great chanter, and it isn't even to become a really great meditator in terms of achieving psychic powers or, uh, or the jhanas or anything like that. Its purpose is aimed at the destruction of the taints. And all of these kind of, um, uh, all of his teachings have that end. So there's these kind of suttas, which probably people are pretty familiar with, the sutta of the heart word, you know, where people go out, you know, a monk goes out, he gets gains, offerings, and fame, he gets jhanas, he gets psychic powers, and the Buddha compares these various things to like the leaves and branches, to the outer bark, the inner bark, um, and the heartwood, heartwood of the tree. There might be some more there, I can't remember that sutta exactly. But uh, in any event, these kind of various things are like that. They're all kind of, uh, uh, you know, parts of the Dhamma, but the heartwood of the Dhamma is Nibbana. So it can be kind of a little bit um, confusing, especially in uh, the modern era, uh, when uh, apparently what, one thing that happened was when uh, Britain was conquering Burma, conquered Lower Burma, and then went to uh, Upper Burma to conquer Upper Burma. And the king at the time was a Buddhist king, his name was King Mindon. And his response to the British invasion was mainly, um, at least in Lower Burma, to shore up his rule to do different things, but also as an act of making merit, was mainly to purify the Sangha and try to make Buddhism very strong in his country. 
But one of the things that uh, really impressed, apparently, the Burmese, this is one of the things that I've heard, and again, people um, may correct me on this, but uh, was that uh, because of this British invasion, the British were able to overtake the Burmese army with a lot of technology. And so meditation was actually influenced by, say, Western methods of production to a certain extent. So the, after the British invasion is when these kind of very strict meditation methods came out. We do step A, step B, step C, step D, step E, step F, step G, and we arrive at Nibbana. It's kind of, uh, you know, if we standardize, the British were able to produce quite a lot of technology, um, you know, mass produce uh, weapons, mass produce vehicles, mass produce all these things by standardizing all these various steps in a process of manufacture. Um, and in that way, they could come up with these really great outputs. And so this was an influence that happened in Burma, uh, possibly, what I've heard and seems to make sense uh, at the time, uh, which influenced the approach to meditation. So this is one thing, now that in the modern world, uh, there's a very popular, at least in the West, uh, I'm not sure everywhere, it's very popular to have a very specific set of techniques that one does, um, and that should bring kind of exact results every time. There's also a kind of an approach through study where people um, will uh, take up the study of the Buddhist teachings, try to learn his texts very thoroughly, and uh, try to learn the Pali Canon very thoroughly. Some people try to learn the Abhidhamma very thoroughly, all these various things. And uh, there's sometimes courses of studies that go through, you know, huge numbers of suttas or huge amounts of Abhidhamma, all these, uh, all these different things which of course is you know, quite beneficial. I mean, the Buddha's teachings are there to be studied. Uh, they're there and can be studied to develop right view. But uh, one of the things, and there's also, actually there's also other practices too, say like the practice of uh, dana, kind of uh, where people uh, offer food, offer various things, try to help people do these different things. All of these various practices though, if they're kind of um, taken on as an end into themselves, if they're taken on without reference to the end aim of the Buddhist teachings, without reference to the aim of eliminating defilements, without reference to Nibbana, then these kind of teachings don't, they can actually be things that can um, go a bit too far. They can be things that are grabbed the wrong way. So the Buddha uses this simile of the simile of the snake, kind of grab his teachings, um, uh, you know, you grab the snake by the head, you're not in danger, but if you grab the snake by the tail, it turns around and bites you. So in that sutta, he was specifically referring to people who grab the tail of the snake and kind of grab his teachings and try to use them for debate in these various things. But also if we grab, uh, say, knowledge of study and try to use that to, um, you know, gain knowledge and think that that knowledge is a representation of attainment in Buddhist practice. It's a good thing to have a lot of knowledge, but uh, if it doesn't lead to the ending of defilements, then it's, uh, then it's knowledge that hasn't become so useful. It's like somebody who's grabbed the snake at the wrong part. It can turn around and bite them. Some people actually sometimes even become arrogant because of their knowledge. Or it can be the case that somebody practices a lot of meditation in these, using these specific methods, the kind of um, you know, going through things step by step and completes a course or completes a training program or something like that. And as a result, they, uh, they become arrogant or they become conceited. And that kind of grabbing on, not just arrogance or conceit, but that kind of grabbing on to this technique, taking it too far, is something that may not necessarily lead to good results. It can also be the case that with uh, other things, like say if somebody practices dana a lot, but then doesn't keep sila, doesn't keep uh, all these other various uh, aspects of the Buddhist teachings, then it can become something that obscures the other aspects of the Buddhist path that one needs to put together to gain the genuine results. So in all these various modes, what the Buddha kind of tends to describe is that these things, uh, these things come together. Kind of uh, dana, sila, bhavana, they all join. And they're kind of things that kind of uh, encourage each other. They're things that kind of uh, uh, lead to strengthening of one another, like a positive feedback loop. So actually just in this field out here, there's kind of a lot of, uh, you know, uh, rice planting that's, that's being done right now. And so if somebody plants rice and they have good soil, then they have a lot of sun, they have a lot of rain, then all those three things come together and they help this seed grow. 
to help this seed grow into a kind of plant that one can eventually eat and use to nourish oneself. And in the same way, if one, or a similar way, if one takes all these aspects together, not just to the exclusion of one another, but one takes study, you know, one takes uh, meditation, one takes uh, sila and uh, dana, and puts all of them together, it's like having this kind of good sun, good soil, and uh, good rain. And that helps the seed, this seed of our intention, to achieve the end of our suffering grow. It helps this kind of thing grow. The other important aspect about this kind of metaphor of a kind of um, seed growing and being planted in a field is that the Buddhist teachings advancing in them isn't something that we can necessarily plan out. So if the Buddha's, if it was, if it was possible to achieve Nibbana just by doing, uh, you know, a very specific set of instructions every time, then that specific set of instructions would be in the canon. <laughs> you know, the Buddha would have taught it. And, uh, and it would be something that consistently produced these results for whoever did it. And similarly, if it was the case that studying all the time would, uh, would lead one to Nibbana in and of itself, just pure knowledge of the suttas in and of themselves uh, would lead one to Nibbana, then many kind of uh, university professors or all these various people or different things would, would be ar arhants. But it doesn't seem to be the case that that's happening in that same way. And similarly, if just sila alone was enough, then just these people who kept all the five precepts, these various things, they would, uh, they would be achieving um, the paths and fruits in and of that. And there'd be many people in many religions who do that. That's not uh, exclusive to Buddhism. But the thing about the Buddhist teachings is that similar to this field, similar to the way that a farmer grows a plant, he watches it, he or she watches it mature, he or she observes the conditions and adjusts them as needed, depending on how the plant looks, depending how much water came today, depending how the soil looks, was there a flood, how are things looking. One adjusts them and watches the plant to make sure it's growing well. In the same way, one uses these various techniques and adjusts them. One watches them, watches, am I doing too much studying now? How is my meditation going? Yeah, am I keeping sila very strictly? And the thing that one's watching here, this seed that one is watching grow, is the, basically the wholesome qualities that arise in one's mind. As this is the thing about the Buddhist teachings, they're basically a path which describes what to take on as wholesome, what to abandon as unwholesome. So one can evaluate if the seed is growing well, if one reads what's in the canon, and then one can do <laughs> what's in the canon too. If one reads what's in the canon but can't do it, then this means that the seed isn't growing properly. It's not growing in the right way. So can one keep the five precepts perfectly? Can one keep the eight precepts on Uposta days? Can one practice meditation? Can one achieve the jhana? All these various things. Is one developing insight that separates one's mind from the world? Can one practice renunciation? Can one uh, live the way that the Buddha prescribed for, uh, for lay people if they're lay people, for a monk if they're a monk. And this isn't just like a kind of person who's judging or scolding, like, you know, okay, live this way or else. What is it? It is, it's more like a farmer who's watching the seed to make sure that it grows well because they want to eat the fruit of that seed. And so basically when one evaluates one's practice, one evaluates how it's going, one evaluates in this way, am I able to do these things? Am I growing in wholesome qualities? Are these wholesome qualities in me increasing or decreasing? Am I gaining insight into phenomenon? And then one adjusts these various elements of one's practice and sees how it goes. This is where Buddhism becomes a little bit like a science, or, you know, I guess maybe a bit more, you know, even still like a farmer. This is the way a farmer develops skill. Some farmers can probably just, like, I, I have no idea what's going on in some of these rice fields. I've just kind of seen them recently. But some farmers probably just look at it and say, oh, there's enough rain here. The rice will grow well. Some farmers could probably look at a field and, you know, know from looking at the field, oh, you know, there's going to be a problem with water drainage here. And uh, to me, it's all just a field because I have no experience with that. But when one trains one's mind, looks for the ways that wholesome qualities increase, looks for the way that unwholesome qualities decrease, one develops a skill. This skill where one learns to adjust these conditions and gains this kind of more intuitive knowledge. And this is, this is exactly what a skill, uh, mainly, uh, in one of the main ways in which one can uh, say that one has a skill, is one's ability to kind of uh, put together things in situations that are often changing. 
like a carpenter who can build a house, you know, uh, you know, with uh, different levels, different elevations, different schematics, using different woods and different materials and different tools. It's kind of very different than somebody who takes a piece of IKEA furniture and just screws it in, follows step A, step B, step C, step D, step E. Because our mind is like this, it's kind of, there's conditions around the mind that are operating all the time. The conditions that make one happy, the conditions that make one sad, the conditions that are in one's job, the conditions that are in one's family, the conditions that are in one's past. All these things are different for different people and they change quite frequently. The present becomes the past, the future will become the past, all these various things. And so for this reason, one needs to develop this dynamic skill, the skill of being able to evaluate how things are going in the mind and adjust it accordingly. So the Buddha says that, you know, if one can't read the minds of others, one should be able to read one's own mind. And it's kind of just the way, um, not sure if it was the same sutta, but, you know, it gives a simile of a cook, where a cook watches their kind of master to see, you know, what did he like today? What did he like the next day? You know, if he takes... Uh, you know, a lot of spicy food, then give him more spicy food the next day. If he takes a lot of, um, you know, salty food, then give him more salty food the next day. All these various things. And so, in watching this, one learns what the, what the kind of master likes. Whoops, get this here. And then one pleases the master. And in the same way, one kind of learns for oneself. Is this meditation topic the right one for me? Is it the wrong one for me? It's different. It depends on the person. It's like a person liking sweet food, sour food, salty food. Is this kind of uh, environment, you know, this kind of uh, where I practice, is this the right one for me or the wrong one for me? And it's different for everybody. And in the same way, that one gets a reward when working well as a cook for one's boss, and one's boss kind of gives one a money reward, if one practices the Buddha's teachings well, then happiness is the reward for that. That's what one kind of reaps from uh, practicing these things well. In a similar way that a farmer lets their kind of uh, rice crop grow, adjusts it here and there, watches it here and there, they eat the fruit. When a person trains their mind well, then their mind ripens in happiness. Because ultimately this is what everybody is aiming for and basically everything that they do. And I kind of remember when I was a young man uh, one time and uh, our teacher in, in uh, seventh grade, I think it was, he asked, well, you know, what do you think the purpose of, uh, of life is? And uh, I thought about it for a while and put up my hand. So said, I think the purpose of life is to be happy. <laughs> and I said, oh, no, 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 that's not it. You know, the purpose of life is not to be happy. But that kind of answer actually made a lot of sense to me. It was kind of, you know, what... What am I doing things for if it's not to be happy? That's the end aim of, uh, of everything that I do. However misguided it might be, whatever the results of it might be, the end aim is to achieve kind of happiness. And in the same way, whatever somebody wants out of houses, whatever somebody wants out of cars, whatever somebody wants out of their family, whatever somebody wants out of status, whatever somebody wants out of kind of fame, all these various things, uh, they have happiness at their end, as their end their end aim. They have happiness is what that person is aiming for. So this is one of the things that people turn to Buddhism for because after searching for a while for happiness in these various things, people sometimes realize they're only getting a little and it doesn't last too long. It kind of lasts a certain amount of time. One gets a new car, one gets a new house, one gets a new job. One is happy for a little bit but then after a while that happiness fades and one needs a better car or a better house, or a better job to maintain that same level of happiness. And this is the thing about craving. <clears throat> this is the thing about desire, is that it's never something that can be satisfied. And kind of one trains one's mind to desire, that desire isn't ended through training one's mind to desire. It's not delayed through getting what one desires. Essentially what one train, one's, train mind, one's mind to do is to want more. And so it's only allayed that desire is only kind of satisfied for a brief period of time. So it's for this reason that the Buddha instructs, uh, instructs us basically to turn inwards, not to look for happiness in these kind of external things. All of his teachings tend to be, are, you know, tend to be aimed at the end of Nibbana, and the road to this end is, doesn't lead outwards necessarily, doesn't lead outwards to 
building more buildings doesn't lead outwards to more financial success, doesn't lead outwards to a better reputation. It leads inwards and outwardly things fall away. Outwardly one's attachments fall away. Outwardly one's, uh, sometimes one's involvement with the world falls away as one turns more and more inwards. And when these things fall away, one learns to look for resources that are inside. The nice thing about the Buddhist teachings, the, uh, one of the really great things about it is that some of the resources that are inside people, some of the potentials for happiness that are inside people are much greater than the, than the potentials for happiness that exist in the world at large. They're much greater than the potentials for happiness that exist in houses, in cars, in one's family, all these various things. Because these are kind of potentials that unless one practices, one doesn't get to experience. So I remember one time I was uh, staying at a monastery and uh, uh, at that monastery, they have this kind of Q&A session where the, the lead teacher goes around and kind of like um, asks everybody in a circle, like, do you have a question? 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 And different lay people will come different days to this Q&A. And he kept going around the circle and there was a woman there with her husband, <coughs> excuse me, and her child. And she seemed kind of upset when she asked her questions. She said, um, you know, almost kind of like, uh, yeah, pretty upset. She says, you know, a mother's love for her, uh, for her child and her, is supposed to be unconditional. But, you know, the last time I was at the monastery, I experienced this kind of pure love, which, that was the word she used, which kind of dwarfed, uh, I can't remember her exact words, but, you know, outstripped, basically, uh, anything that she feels for her child or her husband. <coughs> Excuse me. And she felt quite guilty about that. Kind of, she felt, uh, you know, like that shouldn't be the case. And she was a mother, she should have more love for her child and shouldn't be able to feel any types of uh, happiness, I guess, or she used the word love, that we're beyond that. But the thing about all these things that are external to us that we attach to is that they obscure, they can obscure the potentials for happiness that are inside. So the Buddha uses this kind of, uh, he describes a simile, so kind of right now, actually in here there's this kind of canopy. But out there, there's quite a lot of sun. It says kind of, you know, the bhikkhus, the mind is radiant, which doesn't mean it's pure, it means it's radiant, um, but it's, abs it's, a, it's uh, clouded by these kind of uh, defilements that, uh, that kind of uh, come past, kind of like the sun, um, my own kind of uh, interjection, I guess, that the sun is clouded by, you know, obscured by clouds. <clears throat> and so basically what this means <coughs> is that there are potentials in the mind that are covered over by defilements in the mind, covered over by attachments in the mind, like these kind of various trees, they form this canopy that string together in the same way sometimes one's attachment to money, attachment to cars, attachment to uh, family, attachment to all these various things, they become like these kind of trees that grow up and then the branches intertwine and form a canopy. And that canopy can seem like a safe place, it can seem like a place that might shelter one from the rain, but what it also does is it obscures the sun so that one can't see the kind of uh, brightness uh, that is outside this canopy. And so in a similar way, when one has all these various attachments externally, it can obscure one's potential for happiness internally. So the road that the Buddha teaches one to go down is one that leads in, one that leads away from external attachments, and one that leads to higher types of happiness. It's the kind of uh, path that one goes down. So it's not a barren path. Yeah. So this is another way that one can judge if one's kind of practice is going well. If one's kind of uh, rice plant is growing straight, if it's getting enough water, if it's getting enough sun, what needs to be adjusted is that eventually this kind of practice leads to happiness. It wouldn't lead one to becoming more, you know, neurotic or worse off. One will become kind of more peaceful generally and more calm generally, although there might be times when one uh, suffers from having to give things up that were bad habits that one enjoyed before. So in this way one can evaluate, am I on the right track, am I on the right path? And this kind of evaluation is something that, knows one, that one knows directly. One doesn't need uh, another person to tell one. It's like if a farmer plants this kind of rice plant, allows it to grow, it keeps growing and then it bears fruit. When that farmer harvests the rice, and eats it, then nobody can convince him, <laughs> him or her, that, uh, that his technique for planting rice, that that didn't bear fruit. 
might be some better ways or some more efficient ways, but that he's grown the rice well enough he can eat it. He can satisfy his hunger. And in a similar way, the Buddhist teachings are aimed at this end. And a kind of Western philosophy has this aim through the eye to discover what it is out there, what is the reality out there. But we, if, we, if we approach the Buddhist teachings through this means, that we're going to study them and learn all the suttas, you know, by heart and, you know, do all these things and, you know, get a complete picture of the Dhamma, then we can sometimes grab the, the tail of the snake and have it turn around and bite us. We can think that we know about the Buddhist teachings, but we may not really know. Because the knowledge of the Buddhist teachings, the true knowledge of them, is the knowledge of the lessening, of defilements in one's mind, the gaining of wholesome qualities in one's mind, and the knowledge of the destruction of, of one's taints in one's mind. This is what makes one know what the Buddha taught about. And this is like the farmer kind of uh, being able to eat the rice for himself. That's when his hunger is allayed. Because this is what uh, Indian philosophy, I guess we were saying, was kind of aimed at, you know, in general, kind of trying to find a permanent source of food. And actually, the Buddhist teachings go beyond the need for a source of food, even beyond the need to eat entirely. And that happiness, that happiness that comes from not having to have any external attachments, from not having the canopy overhead, from not having the sun obscured, from going beyond even pure and impure, that's a happiness that doesn't change. That's the happiness of Nibbana. And that's what people are looking for. This is the aim the end aim, trying to find a permanent happiness of everything that one does. Whether it's getting a new house, or a new car, or having your, one's children get good grades, or having status, all of them have their aim uh, as happiness. But true happiness is only to be found in this path, a true happiness that lasts, that's not subject to change, is only to be found when one turns away from external things because whatever is put together is bound to fall apart. It's a path that goes inwards. It's a path that leads onwards when one learns to observe one's wholesome qualities to see if they're growing, observe one's unwholesome qualities to see if they're declining, and one learns to move inwards to try to find high and high, higher and higher levels of peace until eventually one finds something that goes beyond conditions entirely. And this is the ending of the need to eat. This is Nibbana. And this is what we're looking for as Buddhists in our Buddhist practice.